to the fifth lecture on Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, here carrying on with the chapter titled Reason. Following the chapter on self-consciousness, Hegel now wants to deal with the structure of self-consciousness and its reasons. Here, reasons form the essential dimension of Hegelian idealism. For Hegel, the basic definition of his idealism is a symmetry, a symmetry between the objective world or nature and subjective thought or mind. For Hegel, when subjective thought or mind reaches into a symmetry with the objective world or nature, this is the conditions for idealism. You can see here with this symmetry that for Hegel, the natural sciences would be the peak or the height of idealism, paradoxically making scientific materialism the ultimate form of idealism. For Hegel, this form of idealism becomes a self-determining universality. In other words, it's not a universal that just exists independent of human beings, but is active in self-mediation. The universal is always already a self and the becoming of selves. In this sense, idealism and the whole process of the natural sciences are not just the discovery of nature, but also the imposition of our ideal onto nature. This, I think, captures a very critical transition from a natural sciences which reflects to a natural sciences which actually creates. This would all fall into Hegel's idealism. What's also essential for Hegel is the transition from reasonableness to spirituality. Reasonableness doesn't include the very process of reason, the very spiritual process or phenomenology of spirit. When we include spirit, when we include the entire phenomenology of spirit, what we're really interested in is not discovering a pre-existing universality, but formalizing a universality that is self-consistent with our own spirit. Let's first focus on reason itself. Reason manifests itself in particular universalities. That is, me, Cadell, I am a particular universality. You watching this are also a particular universality. That means that we both hold a universal structure of reason as particular entities. The fact is that in this development of particular universalities, there is a motion which Hegel identifies from the external other being seen as a negativity to the external other being seen as a positivity. What this means is that thought recognizes that it's not in symmetrical relation to the objective world, that it doesn't know everything, it cannot know everything, and that there's an asymmetry between itself and the world. Emotionally speaking, thought perceives this as a negativity at first. This is before it divines its own presence in the world as an individual. Recognizing that its own presence in the world as an individual, its own participation in universality, is necessary for the becoming of spirit itself and even necessary for the existence of the self as an individual. From this point, in the transition from the external other as a negativity to a positivity, Spirit learns to deeply trust its own instinct of reason as a guiding principle and learns to emotionally integrate the asymmetry as, again, a positive feature. Let's here give a quote from Hegel. Quote, In this movement of being for self, it has also become aware of its unity with this universal, which for us no longer falls outside of it since the superseded single individual is the universal. This middle term between change unchange is the unity directly aware of both and connecting them. Now that self-consciousness is reason, its hitherto negative relation to otherness turns round into a positive relation. Reason assured of itself 
is at peace with otherness and can endure it. Now self-consciousness and being possess difference in itself, and for its essence is just this, to be immediately one and self-same in otherness, or in absolute difference. This reason remains a restless searching in its very searching declares that the satisfaction of finding is a sheer impossibility. Actual reason, however, is aware. It is not yet in truth reality, and it is impelled to give filling to the empty mind. So this quote, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a little bit to unpack here um, that's really important. What I already emphasized, that the particular, ind the particular individual starts to see, perceive that it is part of the universal, that its own reason is part of the universal development, and that this leads to uh, a, a negative relation with otherness turning into a positive relation with otherness. In other words, knowledge becomes more comfortable with unknowing, knowledge becomes more um, certain in uncertainty, it no longer desires to reduce certainty to itself or reduce all of the otherness to itself in certainty, like the Cartesian cogito. It's a fully social and historical I. So this is a lot different than the Cartesian cogito and at the same time is mobilizing the self-assuredness and the certainty of the Cartesian cogito in a historical, social way. This is very important in Hegel. And also what's crucial here is that Hegel is not reducing this process to identity, but is saying that this acceptance of absolute difference and otherness is crucial. Um, this is uh, an important way to uh, understand, not to make straw man arguments of the Hegelian dialectic, saying that Hegel just reduces everything to identity or narcissistic self-reflection, but is bringing spirit into comfort in uncomfort, bringing spirit into certainty in uncertainty, identity in relation to difference mobilized by the contradiction, and that recognizing that reason here is searching to fill up some empty mind, some lack, some void that it senses, which is the difficulty with the emotional integration of this process. Let's move on to the next for reason. So reason here now attempts to formulate laws, formulate laws of the otherness. This is of course a big feature of the natural sciences. We see this with Newton. We see this with Newton and Leibniz and many other thinkers in the early natural sciences trying to formulate laws that are invariant, that are constant, that never change. And at the same time, recognizing that the successful description and classification of the natural world in terms of laws can only be successful, or perhaps today we would say partially successful in the inorganic realm, where we can make sense of the inorganic realm with natural laws, but we cannot do that with or the organic realm. We cannot use physical laws to reduce biological organisms. There's a type of organic freedom where the sciences, the sciences reach a limit. This is recognized today in the sciences of emergence, the sciences of complexity, where the emergence of chemistry and the emergence of biology and the emergence of higher order phenomena do not seem to be reducible to physical law. So there's freedom in nature, there's, and this especially becomes obvious with organism. This especially becomes um, obvious with consciousness itself. And so Hegel's here recognizing that reason has a desire to make the unknown known, has a desire to formulate eternal laws, but that these eternal laws reach their own contradiction when it comes to life and consciousness, life and mind itself. And this is important to recognize. Here, a quote from Hegel. The aspects of law which the instinct of reason proceeds to observe are organic and inorganic nature in their relation to one another, 
Here we have law as the connection of a universal element with the formative process of the organism which has the elementary being over against it and exhibits it within its organic reflection. Such laws are seen at a glance to display a poverty which does not do justice to the manifold variety of organic nature. Organic nature in its freedom can divest its forms of these characteristics and of necessity everywhere presents exceptions to such laws or rules, as we might call them, amounts to no more than the great influence of environment. Such relations of organisms to the elements they live in cannot therefore be called laws. Neither the individuality nor the universal element is absolutely in and for itself. They behave at the same time as essentially connected but in such a way that their independence and mutual indifference are the predominant feature." End quote. So this is a beautiful passage where Hegel is basically identifying that organic and inorganic nature have a relation to one another, but that the organic is somehow over and above the inorganic, since by definition the inorganic is reflected by the organic. You can never escape this way in which the organic and the inor inorganic nature have a type of asymmetry. The way in which the organic and the inorganic have a um, negative relationship in some sense. Um, that the, even the idea of inorganic laws are coming from organism, coming from mind. So they cannot be mind or the organism or mind cannot reduce inorganic nature because it it's not including itself in the very process of this reduction it's not understanding its its own organism it's not understanding the nature of its own organism and its own uh, mind so this is what hegel's here barring us from in some sense and then opening us up to being inquisitive to the nature of organic nature as something that, like he says, it, it displays a variety, a manifold variety, which you do not see in an organic nature. And, and any law which would be applied to the organic realm would not do justice to the organic realm. So very, very um, relevant passages. And I think um, essentially important passages for any philosopher interested in science, uh, and interested in life sciences and interested in the relation between the life sciences and the natural world in a way that's not reducing life sciences to the inorganic realm, as we see in many sciences, as we see a tendency to um, very strongly, not to always remember the emergence, not to always remember the, the irreducibility of the organic to the inorganic. So then reason um, comes to understand that the individual earth and its life forms um, possess a type of law in themselves, what he calls principles of, na principles of necessary tendency, uh, that these principles of necessary tendency cannot be observed from externally, cannot be observed from without, as you would in, in the typical sciences, uh, but rather that this necessary tendency emerges internal to the organism, internal to the mind, uh, and, and, and is invisible to external gaze, is in, in some way a way in which nature becomes more, even more mysterious um, than the inorganic realm, where something appears to be as a feature of the thing hiding from itself. Um, as something that has a, you could say, an irreducible interiority. There's an irreducible interiority. Um, and this is linked to teleology and Hegel's understanding of teleology. Um, and you could see here the way in which there's a conflict between Hegelian dialectics, Hegelian phenomenology, and Newtonian mechanics, where there's no teleology, uh, where there's no final causation. This is seen as a uh, an image of Aristotelian philosophy that is no longer necessary is an outdated physics. But Hegel is here reviving it dialectically, even evolutionarily in some way. 
So here, let's give a quote. The necessity of organism can no longer be observed in the world of reality, but has withdrawn in what is called a teleological relation. It is a conception which leaves necessity of law behind and operates spontaneously above it. We must examine most closely this determination of end, both as it is in itself and as it is for the instinct of reason. The notion of end in its, notion, in its role of reason rises as its essence and is related purposively to an other, which means that its relation is a contingent one. But the essence of their relation and their action has a different meaning from the one sense perception at first finds. The necessity in what takes place is hidden and shows itself only in the end, even if it has also been there from the beginning. The necessary universality of organic life falls in its actuality in itself directly into the extreme of singleness without a genuine mediation of its own, and has the significance not of the earth, but of the oneness imminent in life. So this is a really um, important passage to understand a Hegelian science of teleology, a Hegelian science of life and mind, where he's again recognizing this necessity of the organism, which can't be observed externally, but has withdrawn into itself. And that there's this way in which this, this withdrawing into self and this teleological relationship represented in, in the organism um, has its own, has its own in itself, uh, which, which he says it rises above any, any, uh, uh, natural law. Um, it doesn't recognize any natural law. Um, it, 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 it thus, uh, requires us to think a universality which inscribes contingency into itself, meaning that there organism has a degree of freedom it can make a de make a determination to, of its own end uh, and not the end of the universe or not the end of the inorganic universe i should say the other interesting thing is that he posits that even this teleology has no relation to the earth has no relationship to physical reality but says has a, a significance to the oneness imminent in life, meaning that life is not one, mind is not one, but that there's a oneness imminent in this teleological necessity, in this necessity which emerges from contingency, which emerges from freedom, the oneness emerges internal to it uh, and is imminent to it. Um, so very subtle dialectical uh, points here by Hegel, which uh, often get um, misunderstood. So here you have the three levels of reason for Hegel, where first the external otherness moves from negative to positive, meaning that the reason sees external otherness as a positive thing and not something that has to be reduced to known categories. It does not have to be reduced to eternal laws where we know everything, but sees external otherness as a positive thing, as a, a condition for its own activity, its own free activity, uh, that even though the reason tries to formulate laws, it, it also recognizes that there is an organic freedom and that this organic freedom is diverse, that this organic freedom has its own will, has its own internal interiority which cannot be observed, and that from this interiority and from this teleolo teleology, there, from the contingency of the freedom, a necessity emerges and a tendency emerges, and this necessity and this tendency is towards a quote, an imminent oneness, an imminent oneness. This is very, very, um, very, I think, beautiful, dialectical formulations. So now moving on to another levels of reason, you have reason being concerned about itself, reason thinking about reason, reason being meta-rational, you might say. 
and reason becomes interested. Are there laws of thought? Um, uh, how to understand the way in which reason and self-consciousness um, is determining universality. Um, and, and Hegel here explores the notion of abstract negativity, meaning that the way reason abstracts is itself through series of negations, abstraction through series of negations, through series of what it is not, through otherness, in other words, through otherness, that it's not self-similar, <laughs> that it's not symmetrical, that there's an asymmetry between thought and matter, which is again Hegel's idealism. So let's give a quote here from Hegel. Observation finds that this free notion, whose universality contains just as absolutely within, in, in, within it developed individuality, only in the notion which itself exists as notion, in self-consciousness. When observation now turns in upon itself and directs its attention to the notion existing as free notion, it finds thought is the abstract movement of the negative, a movement wholly retracted into simplicity. In their truth as vanishing moments in the unity of thought, they would have been taken as a knowing or as a movement of thought, but not as laws of being. But observing is not knowing itself, and is ignorant of it. It converts its own nature into the form of being. The more precise development belongs to speculative philosophy, in which thoughts show themselves to be what they are in truth, viz. single vanishing moments whose truth is only the movement of thought knowing itself. So this is a brilliant passage, but also a complicated passage, where Hegel is saying that thought is here observing itself as a free notion and trying to understand itself as a free notion, and recognizing that it contains a pure individuality, a freedom in self-consciousness, and that its own movement is a negative one, like I was saying. Uh, and and, and, it, and, and Retracted into simplicity means these negations in themselves are simple negations. Um, they're not necessarily complex. Thought in and of itself has a, always says simple notion. The simple notion of a negation, no. And that these are the vanishing moments in the unity of thought. So that thought as a whole is a unity and that it appears in time as vanishing moments. Moment after moment after moment after moment. And that observing these thoughts is not knowledge in and of itself. And so just staying in the mode of observation is a withdrawal, a retraction from active knowledge, is a retraction from the movement of thought itself. Um, and that brings Hegel to the notion of speculative philosophy. For Hegel, speculative philosophy, the free notion speculating on the truth, is the truth, the movement of truth itself, and uh, a type of daring activity of thought, a willingness to participate in the becoming of universality as opposed to merely being on the sidelines observing. Just, uh, just observing, but, but participating speculatively. That this is knowing itself. This is the philosopher. This is the philosopher for Hegel. So now Hegel becomes interested in the mind-matter relationship. In other words, the active, but here there's, there's a way in which we've already reached the mind-matter relationship from the perspective of mind, which we'll go into deeper. Because the two sides of matter and mind are two sides, but it, it, the mind here is the, the active speculative element. In other words, mind is speculating, matter is not speculating. Mind is speculating about matter, not vice versa. There's the asymmetry here and the idealism here. And that this is also happening in a way through individuation, through the mind somehow as a totality being individuated in each particular element. And that the becoming of these minds and their speculative capacities and their knowing capacities 
is the spiritual function of the universality. The spiritual function of the universality is this, this speculative notion, this free speculative notion. So here, quote, The moments constituting the content of the law are the individuality itself and its universal inorganic nature, viz. the, gen the given circumstances, situation, habits, customs, religion, and so on. They embrace specific as well as universal elements and are at the same time something which provides material for observation and which expresses itself in the form of individuality. Now the law of this relation of the two sides should have a double gallery of pictures, one of which would be the reflection of the other. The one, the gallery of external circumstances which completely determine and circumscribe the individual. The other, the same gallery translated into the form in which those circumstances are present in the conscious individual. The former the spherical surface, the latter the center, the center which represents that surface within it. This is a very beautiful image here of the relationship between mind and matter. Because he's saying here that the exter you, can you, ha you cannot understand materialism independent of mind or mind independent of material. They're in this asymmetrical relation. He's articulating this, this weird relation where there's universal elements which all mind is somehow contained within. And at the same time, there's this individuation within the container and these expressions of individuality. So you have this weird double gallery of the external circumstances within which individuation occurs, and then the individuation, which is has the powers of representation of this externality. And he has this idea here of on the one hand, you have the spherical surface. So the external world for Hegel here is a spherical surface. It doesn't necessarily have depth or density to it. The external material world is not necessarily something with, with density and depth to it, just a surface. And then you have this center, which is the eye. The center, which is the eye, which is representing, uh, representing that surface with images, with symbols. Um, and so I think this is a very interesting form of way of thinking about materialism, especially for our day today, and especially in a day where consciousness or the I as representing is always on surfaces. We're no longer with the natural world as we used to be. Uh, but the natural world is in some sense disappearing onto surfaces, our computer screens, our our, 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 our cell phone screens. These are the surfaces upon which these are our worlds now. So I really think that this, this, this sentence is extremely productive, useful to think about the way in which mind exists uh, actually with its materiality. So he says there's a unity of the two sides in mind again this asymmetry because it's not a unity it's a unity of the two sides but it's a unity of the two sides in the eye which is the reversal of how scientific materialists usually think he says mind ultimately reduces matter to its own model in other words here the active principle of the mind the speculative philosophy uh is interested here in developing its own truth, its own becoming with universality, um, and reducing um, reducing the external world to its own model, its own model of the world. Scientists here are always more fascinated with their own model of the reality than they are with the so-called reality, which of course we know in Kant is noumenal. Noumenal. It's only merely here that Hegel is reversing Kant's own thinking of the noumena and making it here internal to mind's own speculative rational activity, which is a beautiful, beautiful move, beautiful, beautiful move. Here to quote Hegel again, the spherical surface, the world of the individual, has at once an ambiguous meaning 
It is the actual state of the world as it is in and for itself, and it is the world of the individual. It is the latter either insofar as the individual has merely coalesced with that world, or it is the world of the individual in the sense that the actual world as given has been transformed by the individual. Since on account of this freedom the actual world is capable of twofold meaning, the world of the individual is to be comprehended only from the individual himself. Thus there is no question of a being which would be in and for itself and was supposed to constitute one universal aspect of a law. Individuality is what its world is, the world that is its own. Individuality is itself the cycle of its action in which it has exhibited itself as an actual world, and it is simply and solely the unity of the world, a unity whose sides do not fall apart. In other words, the two, the, the one is two, the one is two on the side of mind. This is crucial. The one is two on the side of mind. And that this relationship with the spherical surface, so its nature kind of disappears here into a spherical surface and the world of the individual. And this is, I think, almost prophetic to our contemporary world. This is prophetic to the nature of spirit in itself, understanding spiritual motion in itself. So many natural motions of spirit, so many natural motions of our own relationship with surfaces um, become fully understandable, become fully logical. Um, that we, we're not actually interacting with the world as we normally think we're interacting with the world. That Yes, there are sort of external givens, even if we don't know really what these external givens are in themselves. But the real nature of what we usually are interacting with as external givens are really about the transformation processes by the individual. The way the individual constantly through abstract negation is transforming. That's, that's the crucial notion of, of Hegel's universality the way in which abstract universality is constantly transforming through negation. This is, this is, and that these two sides don't fall apart. So here we have first the inward motion of reason becoming interested in reason, meta-reason, meta-rational, becoming interested in laws of thought and abstract negativity. Then recognizing the two-side relation on the side, asymmetrically on the side of mind. One is two on the side of mind. And that this, these two sides don't fall apart, but are to be understood as the very processes of the one's transformations. Remember this imminent oneness, this imminent oneness. This is happening in regards to our own individual transformations, our own abstract negations. Moving on here. Now that reason has understood now reason has understood the first order external and then has also understood the inner it now brings the inner to the outer so the inner tries to impose itself on the outer this is what hegel refers to as a hedonistic imperative that one's own ex one's own satisfaction one's own inner world and the satisfaction and the joy from one's own inner world, however that's represented on the inner surface, is imposed. Everyone becomes their own little dictator. Everyone becomes their own little dictatorship, imposing on the external otherness. And this is the first order here of reason bringing its inner to the outer. Let's quote Hegel here. Individuality has now become the object for observation. The individual exists in and for himself. He is a free activity, but he has also an intrinsic being. But since the individual is only what he has done, his body is also the expression of himself, which he himself has produced when he sets his original nature to work. We have then to consider how to determine the relation between these two sides, the inner and the outer. This outer acts only as an organ in making the inner visible. The speaking mouth, the working hand, 
the legs, are the organs of performance and actualization, but the externality which the inner obtains as a reality is separated from the individual. Outer expressions in which the individual lets the inner get completely outside of him. The organ does not, therefore, provide the expression which is thought. So here this is crucial. We get an outer in Hegel, an authentic outer, an, an authentic externality. But this externality and this outer is the production of the inner and this projection of the inner into the outer under this hedonistic imperative. And here the spirit reaches a new contradiction. It reaches the contradiction that this external production of itself, the hedonistic motion, escapes the spirit itself. It escapes the spirit. It completely gets outside of him, he says. And therefore says that this external production by the spirit does not provide the expression which the spirit wants because it, it, it escapes itself. Uh, you can think here, he's, he, interesting that he brings up specifically the speaking mouth, the working hand and the legs. So for me right now, with my speaking mouth, I'm producing an outside. These videos are my outside because you're watching them and I'm not currently performing it as you're watching. It's outside of me completely. It's escaped me into, the, into a realm of intersubjective spirit. And so if what Hegel's saying here is, is if I and my speaking mouth were to identify with this external production as the organ of my activity and my identity, I wouldn't find satisfaction there. I wouldn't find satisfaction there because it's in your hands now. It's in your mouth now. And you can totally negate me. You can totally negate me and bypass me and, 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 and create your own thing. So it's not what I'm looking for as spirit or, or vice versa, uh, whether it's the working hand or the legs or the speaking mouth. Very crucial, very important. So then spirit transcends the hedonistic imperative and seeks to... Um, find a active external relation which escapes just its its projects to its drive because all of spirit's projects will escape it but its drive is in itself and in itself and for itself so the life of the heart has to become one with its task and its deed another way of saying this is that the life of the heart has to align its desire with its duty, its heart with its deed, its action, its drive. And this is, this is what becomes crucial, not the external products, but the drive. So in other words, not the externality which I'm producing through my speaking mouth this moment, but through my very drive of speaking, my very drive of researching, my very drive of of, of philosophy itself, of speculative thought. Here's a quote. Individuality gives up that reflectedness into self and places its essence in the work it has done. The contradiction this observation encounters has the form of the practical and the theoretical, both falling within the practical aspect of itself, in the individuality as being at the same time reflected out of this doing into itself and making this its object qua spirit is a bone. The deed is the immediate sensuous presence of the individual spirit. The forming of opinions prima facie about the presumed outward presence of spirit is natural, but what is to be recognized is the capacity to be one. The fixed abstract quality thereby gets lost in the concrete, infinitely determinant character of the particular individual. For the individual self-consciousness is, qua being, inexpressible. The science of knowing men lacks both foundation and finality. It's very interesting. 
So when he's saying it gives up on reflectedness into self, what that means is that its external products cannot be contained within itself. And that the theoretical work of spirit has to be linked deeply to the practical. And even that the practical has primacy. The practical work of spirit, theoretical work of spirit is essential, but it has to be connected to the practical work of spirit. This is the meaning of spirit is a bone. The abstract has to be made practical, concrete. It can't just be floating in the clouds. This is spirit as a bone, a beautiful axiom. And the, the deed is what spirit is. The action is what spirit is. So again, spirit is a bone. And the, the drive of spirit is this capacity to be one, which is very hard to do as a, as a drive. It's very easy to lose oneself in the drive, to become overwhelmed by the negativity. To find the negativity is too much. The otherness is too much. So to remain one is a difficult task for spirit, to, to stay one in the drive, which has a very important relationship to the perspectival shift on, on desire, which becomes very important in, of course, psychoanalysis. And so the most important line here is, is he says, the science of knowing men, in other words, the science which, t which is interested in knowledge and, and knowing men, has no foundation, has no finality, because it's nothing but the drive itself. The drive itself is abyssal freedom. The drive itself is its own, has only its own imminent oneness to contend with. Very important. So here, again, spirit is a bone, the flesh of spirit, that spirit brings its abstraction to the ethical life of active community. In other words, Spirit brings its abstractions to an embeddedness in the practical life world, the communal life world of spirit. That it has no value outside of that. That it must embed itself in organic links. This is the crucial dimension of flesh of spirit. Spirit is a bone. To come into organic, authentic, free relation with the other. This is crucial. Quote, if we look on this still inner spirit as substance on the stage of having an outer existence, then in this notion there is disclosed the realm of ethical life. For, there, for this is nothing else than the absolute spiritual unity of the essence of individuals in an intrinsically universal self-consciousness that takes itself to be actual in another consciousness. Reason is present here as the fluid universal substance which yet bursts asunder into many completely independent beings. They are conscious of being these separate independent beings through the sacrifice of their particularity. Instead of the heavenly seeming spirit of the universality of knowledge and action in which the feeling and enjoyment of individuality are stilled, there has entered into them the spirit of the earth." End quote. So this is very crucial because Hegel's saying here that ultimately the theoretical abstract mind finds its truth in the realm of ethical life and of losing its individuality, losing its particularity in the recognition of the others and to embed oneself with the others. You can see why here Marx picks up here Hegel. You can see why Marx here picks up Hegel and, and sees the imminence of the free notion in communism. That the universality of knowledge needs to be brought and, and entered into the spirit of the earth. Meaning it has to be brought to the concrete community, has to be brought to the, the ethical spiritual life. This is, this is what consumes intelligence, what, what consumes reason, which consumes our, our spontaneous teleological uh, relation to imminent oneness. So here we have the inner coming to the outer. And this starts with hedonism and an imposition of self onto other, recognizing the limitations of this because one's own external products escape oneself, moving then from the project to the drive, the individual drive, my own imminent oneness, 
and then embedding this own imminent oneness into the flesh of spirit, spirit as a bone, into the ethical life of the community itself. However this ethical community forms, it's almost, it's almost irrelevant what ethical community, but just that this process is unfolding when the mind fully attempts to become an active, speculative, living mind. So then we here have the formulation of what Hegel calls the law of the heart, which is the feelings, the emotions of spirit in intersubjective relation, how to be, how, how to, how to bring reason to love, how to love. And Hegel here tries to formulate the law of the heart is that it's almost as if the heart already knows but just that there's this, this incredible emptiness, this, this, this individual as an end in itself finds itself in an emptiness and, 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 and finds itself struggling to, to actualize the law of the heart. Quote here, what necessity truly is in self-consciousness, it is for this new form of self-consciousness in which it knows its own self to be the principle of necessity. It knows that it has the universal of law immediately within itself. And because the law is immediately present in the being for self-consciousness, it is called the law of the heart. This form takes itself to be qua individuality, essence like the previous form, but the new form is richer because its being for self has for it the character of necessity or universality. The law, therefore, which is immediately self-consciousness's own law or a heart which, however, has within, its, within it a law, is the end which self-consciousness proceeds to realize. We have to see whether its realization corresponds to this notion and whether in that realization it will find that this its law as its essential nature. This is a really difficult passage, a really complex passage, and even a, a passage that, that's it's, it's just difficult, difficultly formulized by Hegel, but the law of the heart is basically that self-consciousness recognizes in itself a necessary truth. And that this necessary truth has something to do with love, has something to do with the heart, and that it is something to do with the, 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 very, the very being of its individuality. The, the purpose of its individuality is to realize this as its essential nature. And in trying to realize this as its essential nature, Hegel says the heart finds itself in an irreducible conflict, an impossible conflict. He says there's a profound disunity in the ethical spiritual life between the individual and the law of the world. In other words, the individual desire to, 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 to actualize the law of the heart, to, to make its inner heart, the, what it reflects outside, again, that's Hegel's idealism, is, he says, thwarted by the law of others, that there are other hearts, that there are other laws, that there's difference, absolute difference, and that one's law of the heart and the other's law of the heart can go into conflict, and how to resolve this conflict, how to uh, overcome this contradictory um, level of, of spirits becoming. Here, quote, The heart is confronted by a real world, for in the law, for in the heart the law is not yet realized. The reality is a law by which individuality is oppressed, a violent ordering of the world which contradicts the law of the heart, and a humanity suffering under that ordering, subjected to an alien necessity. The fact is the law of all hearts is immediately this universal. Thus the consciousness which sets up the law of its heart meets with resistance from others because it contradicts the equally individual laws of their hearts. It is from virtue now that the universal is to receive its true reality by nullifying individuality. For in so far as it is an individuality, it is the activity of the conflict it wages with the way of the world but its aim and true nature is to conquer the reality of the way of the world. What the conflict offers, 
to it is the universal animated by individuality and existing for another, in other words, the actual good. So this, some beautiful passages here. He's basically saying there's a, an asymmetry between the law of the heart and the way the world is. The way the world is. In other words, what my heart expresses and what my heart desires is radically different from the way the world is. And that my heart views the world as both an, impre an oppression to my heart and uh, also an oppression to all other human beings. You can again see here where Marx picks up from Hegel. That the self on this level is alienated from its own necessity of, 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 of being with its heart and to see its heart reflected ideally in the world. And also that in the attempt of the heart to formulate its heart as the will of the world, it runs into the contradiction that others have their own will and their own heart. And that the, the hearts, the law of hearts, themselves become contradictory. This is true in any romantic conflict. This is true in any communal organization. That there are multiple laws of the hearts. And that Hegel says that what we have to learn in this process is the falling away of our own individuality. That the very way in which our hearts are in conflict is a sign, a mirroring, by which we have to get rid, cleanse ourselves of our own individuality. And only through that can we conquer the way of the world. And that only in that way, when we are existing for another, for an other subject, that we can have the actual good. Again, you can see here why Marx would be so taken by, these, by, the, by this dialectic, by this phenomenology. So then Hegel tries to formulate the moral destiny of this process, of this de ultimately this emptying of the individual for the other. That the, the I recognizes that it's in all the eyes. The I recognizes that it's self with the other, that all the eyes together is the universal. All the eyes together is individual. Individual problems and circumstances are with a concern for anyone and everyone. Meaning that your problem is my problem, my problem is your problem, and we have to link the problems. We have to see that we're all dealing with the same problem. The problem of love, the problem of the heart, the problem of the imminent oneness. This is Hegel. Quote, The universal being is the action of the single individual and of all individuals, and whose action is immediately for others, or is a matter in hand and is such only as the action of each and every one, the essence which is the essence of all beings, viz. spiritual essence. Consciousness learns that no one of these moments is subject, but rather gets dissolved in the universal matter in hand. Thus the matter in hand no longer has the character of a predicate, and loses the characteristic of lifeless abstract universality. It is rather substance permeated by individuality, just as much qua individual or qua this particular individual as qua all individuals. And it is the universal which has being only as this action of all and each and a reality which in fact that this particular consciousness knows it to be its own individual reality and the reality of all. So I think that summarizes here Hegel's emphasis that the individual can no longer ab create this lifeless abstract universality which ultimately all these theories of communism and world politics become lifeless abstract universality which impose their law of the heart on others. So it's not a solution. That all eyes, all eyes and the imminent oneness have to, have to um, realize themselves truly in, in relation to the other in, as a life process in their own action, in their own being. And that the, then only the individual reality and the reality of the all can be realized in their imminent oneness. So here we have the passage where first Hegel recognizes the law of the heart, this virtue, this necessity of the heart is first recognized by spirit. 
Then spirit comes into these irreducible conflicts with other hearts and the nature of the world itself. It sees disunity between itself and the world, disunity between itself and others, and that through these conflicts, through these processes, can cleanse itself of its individuality and see itself in the becoming of all eyes, can see itself in the becoming of all others. And so that's the end of Hegel's chapter on reason. And you see here the importance of Hegel's reason. Hegel's reason is not a lifeless, disembodied reason, but a reason of the whole historical process of spirit, the whole phenomenology of spirit, and the imminent oneness to, 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 the, to the very bodies of the, of the process. And so that's a continuation of the previous lectures where I create the forward, the introduction, consciousness, and self-consciousness, which you can find on a link here at the end of the video. And thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening and paying attention. And I hope you join me for the next video covering Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. Thank you very much.